Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Ask the GBHD Experts Forum, sponsored by BMT Infonet. My name is Sue Stewart, and I will be your host, one of your hosts, for this evening. If you're not familiar with BMT Infonet, we're a not-for-profit organization that provides transplant recipients and their loved ones with high-quality, easy-to-understand information about bone marrow, stem cell, and cord blood transplants. We have many publications, a peer support program, and a website that has a lot of valuable information, including information and videos about GVHD. Before we begin, I would like to thank Pharmacyclics, LLC, an Abbey company, and Jazz Pharmaceuticals, whose support in part has made tonight's webinar possible. So this is how tonight's session will proceed. For the first half hour, our GVHD experts will respond to questions that you submitted at the time you registered. We will have them respond to as many of those questions as time allows. For the second half hour, we will take questions submitted by attendees on this call. If you have a question, please type your question into the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. This presentation is being recorded and will be available to review on our website at bmtinfonet.org after the webinar. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's GVHD experts. Dr. Stephen Pavletic is the head of the GVHD and late effects section in the Immune Deficiency Cellular Therapy Program at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Stephanie Lee is the research director. Can we bring Dr. Stephanie? Yeah is a long-term follow-up program at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington. She is also currently the president of the American Society for Hematology. Dr. Sandeep Jain is the director of the Dry Eye and Ocular Graft versus Host Disease Service at the University of Illinois Health in Chicago, Illinois. Please join me in welcoming our guest speakers. So let's begin with the first question. Dr. Pedletic, if I'm having GBHD symptoms, does that mean that the graft versus tumor effect is still working? Good evening. Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, graft versus uh, host disease is tightly connected with uh, graft versus, versus uh, leukemia or graft versus tumor effects. And uh, in general, we say that having a little bit of graft versus host disease is actually a good thing and is associated with best leukemia or malignancy-free outcomes uh, after allogeneic transplantation. It is important to know that if a patient doesn't develop signs of graft versus host disease, at the same time, graft versus leukemia or graft versus tumor effect could be in action so this is not a reason for concern. Just uh, have to follow patient closely and do everything what's necessary in communication with their physician. If uh, the symptoms are exaggerated more than mild, then co often a concern is if uh, graft versus host disease should be treated aggressively with immunosuppression. And all the information we have is yes, if there is more than minimal graft versus host disease, then we do know that anti-tumor effects can go up, but then other risks associated with GVHD go up as well. And in principle, then at that point, graft versus host disease has to be treated per treatment principles and if needed, even aggressively with systemic immunosuppression. Thank you, Dr. Pavletic. Next question, Dr. Lee. Please address joint stiffness, limited range of motion, damage to ligaments and tendons, and hand cramping and stiffness caused by GVHD. Are there remedies? And then along the same line, uh, someone else asks, my daughter has had a locked arm at 90 degree angle for two years with blister-like sores on the arm and now lymphedema in her hand. ECP, Imbruvica, and Jacophy are not helping. Any recommendations to get positive results? 
Um, hi, this is Stephanie Lee, and thanks again for inviting me to this forum. Um, I'm sorry to hear about the, the, these two cases because I think this is unfortunately um, rather common in chronic GVHD. So in both of these situations, um, these people are having what we call sclerotic graft versus host disease, which is basically when the tissue kind of scars down, and that leads to the joint stiffness, to the limited range of motion, um, to the 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 contractures, this locked arm, and it can lead to the ulcers on the skin and to this lymphedema, which is if there's some scarring, then down below that scarring you can get swelling. Um, you know, in terms of the treatment of this, I think it's twofold. One is that um, to try to find effective GBHD treatment so that the scarring process stops. And some of the things that have been mentioned here, ECP, and Bruvica, Jacophy are things we try. There are many other things that we try, and there's also clinical trials that are targeted towards this particular problem. And I think if any particular treatment is not working, I would encourage people to keep looking for additional therapies that might be helpful. I think the other thing that people uh, can try to do is good supportive care. So whenever the joints and the skin are involved like this, trying to attain what flexibility you have you have already by stretching, um, by sometimes massage, and certainly by uh, in terms of the ulcers, um, making sure that you're on good antibiotic or antiviral, antifungal prophylaxis if that's indicated, um, and treating those ulcers aggressively. Um, but this is a very vexing kind of graft versus host disease. Um, and uh, it, you know, you just have to keep trying one thing after another. All right, thank you very much. Uh, for you, Dr. Pavletic, I was recently diagnosed with GVHG of the kidneys. I'm told this is very rare, and there is limited clinical data to support treatment protocols. Is there any new research being done regarding GVHD of the kidneys? Uh, well, thank you for this question. Uh, uh, yes, it's totally correct that uh, GVHD of the kidneys, it's a very rare manifestation and uh, uh, it's uh, certainly then very difficult to do large clinical studies and protocols in such a complication that uh, affects maybe 1% uh, at most of patients uh, after allogeneic transplantation. So. Uh, classically, we don't call, uh, we don't consider GVG of the kidney a classic manifestation of chronic graft versus host disease, but definitely uh, we refer with this term to situations where kidney damage uh, occurs as a consequence of autoimmune reactivity. So donor immune systems works against the recipient. And in this situation, because of this um, uh, hyperactivated immune system, the immune uh, attack happens at the level of kidneys. So it's important because it's, uh, in this situation, it's important to rule out other potential causes of uh, kidney injury. There could be many other uh, diseases, uh, uh, um, I mean, complications after transport. They often there medications related, like tacrolimus or, uh, or cyclosporin and some others, but when chronic GVHG of the kidneys occurs, then it's associated with spilling lots of protein in the urine most commonly. And typically it happens at the time of tapering, so discontinuing immunosuppression between 6 and 12 months after allogeneic transplant. It may or may not be associated with other typical signs of chronic GVHD, and then it has to be uh, treated for principles how nephrologists treat similar diseases in medicine. They call them membranose, glomerular nephritis, and some other names. But basically, uh, using the same principles that usually most commonly involve systemic treatments, they're based on steroids, based on rituximab, MMF, some of those drugs that we know very well, and most commonly a uh, uh, reinstitution of immunosuppression takes care of the problem. In some rare instances, it can be more difficult to get this process under control. Thank you, Dr. Pavletic. Dr. Jane, uh, you're the expert on ocular GVHD. This is the one for you. What is the difference between soft contact lenses, bandage lenses, and scleral lenses? And how do you choose which one to try? Well, thank you for the question. 
Uh, first, I think it is important to understand why a contact lens would work in chronic GBHD at all. And then the choices become easier to understand. Um, it, what happens is that the eye surface gets inflamed in chronic GVHD uh, due to lack of tear production and, um, and, uh, and fibrosis and many other reasons, such that the nerves on the surface uh, become very irritated. And as the eyelids move over the surface, they can cause immense pain, uh, light sensitivity, feeling of grittiness, dryness, just make uh, the uh, feeling from the eyes uh, just miserable. Now, how do you take care of that? Well, if we put a piece of plastic uh, that covers the surface of the eye and uh, separates the eyelid movements out, then uh, one would not feel that pain now because the eyelids are moving over uh, the contact with, on the piece of plastic. And that's exactly the rationale for using uh, contact lenses in GVHD, to heal the surface the, under, the, uh, uh, under the contact lens and uh, to reduce pain and discomfort that uh, is due to eyelid movement on, on the surface. So all contact lenses are basically pieces of plastic. The soft, uh, the, uh, the smaller uh, soft contact lenses, the regular vision corrective contact lenses are fine. They are smaller. They cover primarily the transparent part of the eye, which is the cornea. They don't cover the white of the eye much, but they are very effective. They are easy to insert and. Um, and they are, uh, they are the first choice, in fact, to rapidly uh, help patients uh, get better. Uh, long term, we like to go to scleral contact lenses, which are much larger, the, so they cover the white of the eye also. But a very important difference is that these scleral contact lenses, they vault over the transparent part of the eye, which is the cornea, as opposed to the uh, soft contact lenses, which are in contact with the cornea. So if the surface of the eye, the cornea is very diseased, then obviously you do not want uh, the contact lens to be in contact with the surface of the eye. And, in, and there are other uh, strategies we can employ, uh, for example, putting serum tears uh, um, to help heal the surface under a spiral contact lens. Uh, so which one to try? I think uh, it's fine to go with uh, the soft contact lens first. Uh, and uh, there are some logistics uh, involved, and it's really not to uh, fit the scleral contact lens. The fitting may need uh, some time, but, uh, uh, but finally, our goal is to go to scleral contact lenses. One thing that is very important to understand is that uh, you cannot sleep in the contact lenses. That really increases the risk of uh, infections, uh, both for soft contact lenses and for scleral lenses. Thank you. Uh, next question, Dr. Lee, can com complications arise with GVHD when an IV IgB is administered for a flu A viral infection? So I think this person's asking about um, giving IV IG if someone has a viral infection, is how I'm interpreting this. And I think the short answer is, is essentially no. There's lots of side effects that can happen with the IgG infusion, um, but I wouldn't think that graft-versus host disease flare or response to that would be concerning. There, I think this person might be worried because we do think that antibodies have some um, uh, pathology in GVHD and causing GVHD, but I wouldn't, if the IG, IV IG uh, infusion is indicated for someone's care, I wouldn't be worried about that. Thank you. Next question, Dr. Pavletic. <clears throat> Please discuss treatment options for lung GVHD. Is there anything other than the FAM regimen? And is lung transplant an option if you have bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome? So GVHD, I'm talking about chronic GVHD of the lungs. It's a, a relatively rare manifestation of chronic graft versus host disease. About 10% of patients with chronic graft versus host disease developed uh, lung manifestations. Then we call them uh, bronchiolitis obliterans uh, syndrome. It is very important to follow regular early pulmonary or lung function tests after allogeneic transplantation because uh, symptoms can occur uh, quite late when 
quite a bit of damage to the lungs has already occurred. So that's a one important aspect of uh, approaching to lung chronic GVHD. When uh, these uh, manifestations occur, uh, uh, they are reflected in a decreased lung function and narrowing on the small airways in the lung, sort of like an asthma type of problem. Just asthma can be uh, improved and reversed by interventions. These uh, kind of changes are irreversible because of uh, fibrotic type of scar type of uh, changes on the small airways. Uh, then we have uh, what they, uh, we call bronchiolitis obliterans, and it's one of the more difficult to treat manifestations of chronic GVHD and usual medications like corticosteroids, prednisone in the uh, initial therapy for chronic GVHD, which are often very effective initially, don't really work for bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome well. We usually recommend very short courses of prednisone. And then the mainstay of therapy is, uh, as you correctly mentioned here, FAM. So it's uh, inhaled steroids with a oral uh, Montelukas uh, anti-asthma medication and an antibiotic azithromycin. It's been uh, shown as a, uh, um, a very, very adequate therapy as a frontline uh, for this kind of patients that keeps uh, at least most of the patients uh, stable with this kind of treatment. And uh, we don't like to give systemic steroids in these situations that actually could be detrimental in the long run. It's a major focus of uh, our research and trying to come up with a better approaches. Uh, if FAM is not effective, there are many other options that can be tried, but they're even less effective than in general in second or third line therapy for usual chronic graft versus host disease. It's uh, quite uh, often we resort to using extracorporeal photophoresis for this kind of situations. Uh, uh, common drugs like tacrolimus or cyclosporin can be sometimes used. Uh, there is some uh, uh, substantial evidence that anti-tumor necrosis factor antibodies can be helpful in patients who need something beyond FAM. And uh, uh, you are asking question about lung transplant. The short answer is yes, definitely lung transplant has been done. Uh, um, uh, there are quite a number of cases uh, with uh, advanced bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome that ended up having lung transplant with very good success. But this is not something that we like to advocate. We like uh, uh, to find ways of preventing this uh, 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 situation coming to the point of uh, having lung transport, but in, in, in unfortunate case, uh, somebody needs a lung transport, actually nowadays, uh, at least in the short run, they work very well and patients uh, can get back to very normal function at least for some time. So, um, but basically, uh, lots of research is going in this area. Um, we have high uh, some drugs uh, in interest are so-called JAK inhibitors. Uh, one example example would be JAK. We don't know anything conclusively about these new agents, how they work. There are some other antifibrotics or anti-scarring agents. There, they've been uh, in research, or some other anti-inflammatory drugs that attack neutrophils. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the best recommendation would be uh, to try to find a clinical trial around if uh, 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 assistance is necessary beyond uh, of FAM uh, therapy for lung GVHD. Thank you, Dr. Pavletic. Okay. Dr. Jane, <clears throat> what else can I do for dry eyes? I'm six and a half years out from transplant. GVHD started nearly two years later. I've used steroid drops blood serum eye drops, synthetic albumin eye drops, various over-the-counter drops and gels, cauterization of eyelids, and scleral lenses. The lenses work the best, but only for a short time before my eyes are dry again. I now have non-age-related cataracts due to several years of steroid use. Well, thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, ocular GVHD can be a very difficult problem. And uh, the best uh, uh, way that, in our experience, we've seen it respond uh, to treatments is to use a combination of treatments in uh, a step-down approach, which means that we don't 
uh, add a starter treatment, and if it doesn't work, then uh, stop it and uh, try something else. Uh, a combination of treatments uh, generally gives a better success using anti-inflammatory eye drops like steroids along with uh, scleral contact lenses, along with uh, uh, serum tears, and so on. Now, the question is what else can be done? Because it uh, uh, seems that this patient has done uh, practically everything that I've said. Uh, there are some uh, some guidelines, I guess, some principles that some things that can add to the effect. For example, uh, everything that is used on the eye in these patients should be preservative free. Uh, we can't use any any commercial eye drop in, that is dispensed in a multi-dose bottle has a preservative inside, and we should avoid that. Sometimes we may need to compound uh, preservative-free steroids and other uh, uh, drugs, but that is so. Uh, serum tears, we like to use 50%, and so increasing the concentration can sometimes help, or going on to plasma-rich and growth factors uh, can help. One thing that I uh, feel uh, has a good uh, additive effect is just the way the eye drops are applied. We tell our patients to lay flat on the bed and then put the eye drops uh, on the eye and then gently lift the upper lid so uh, some of it tracks back uh, under the upper lid. Now, that would make sense because if you are sitting up or just the head a little bit tilted back and apply the eye drop to the eye, the gravity is working against you. It just goes into the lower eyelid and onto the cheeks. Uh, we want the eye drop to stay on the eye for some time, and that simple... Uh, technique, uh, our patients tell us, makes a difference. The other thing that uh, we also tell them is to use some non-pharmacological uh, 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 strategies like wearing moisture chamber glasses. Now, these are sunglasses or eyeglasses which have a foam backing uh, or a plastic backing which makes a seal around the eye so that the eye is uh, now are protected from the environment. If it's windy outside or you're driving and there's air blowing on the eye, which can dry the surface out. So there are many other strategies also that we can use. In terms of what else can be done from a, a research perspective from um, eye drops that are, in, are currently under development, there are uh, eye drops that we are looking at. Vimonidine nanoemulsion is one, which is in phase three clinical trials. Uh, platelet cell lysates from cambium is in uh, clinical trials. At our institute, we use uh, uh, human pooled human immune globulin as eye drops, which has uh, given us some good results. But these are all investigational uh, eye drops that are uh, placed under um, under protocols um, uh, for clinical studies. Uh, so the answer: What else can be done? Yes, a lot can be done. Uh, uh, we just can't give up. Uh, that's certainly one thing we can do. The second part of the question uh, is that uh, the, uh, the patient now has an age-related cataract due to several years of steroid use. That's very common. Um, but just the fact that you have the patient has a cataract does not mean that uh, one should rush into cataract surgery. The indication for cataract surgery is if uh, the patient is unable to do uh, the uh, the things in life that they want to and the quality of life has uh, is now reduced and you're not able to do uh, the activities, routine daily activities that you would want to. What could those be? Driving at night, for example, watching TV and it's blurry, even with your best uh, correction of glasses. Cataract surgery in ocular GVHD patient is, uh, is fine. We've uh, have uh, many, uh, hundreds of patients with uh, ocular GVHD with cataracts who have undergone surgery and they all do fine. Yes, there are some special considerations uh, that are needed. Uh, the post-operative uh, recovery may be slightly more uh, uh, prolonged. Uh, there may be a little bit more discomfort. We may have to use contact lenses or uh, uh, use uh, or not use certain uh, eye drops uh, like non-steroidals after surgery. So, yes, there are some special considerations we have to uh, keep in mind. But overall, uh, patients with ocular GVHD do fantastic after cataract surgery. So no problems with that. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Jane. Uh, next question. Dr. Lee, how do you know when GVHD is completely gone 
if I have no symptoms after eight to ten years, is there still a chance it could come back? Thanks, Sue. I think this is a common question for people. Um, you know, the only way that you know that GVHD is completely gone is that you really never have to deal with it again, unfortunately. Um, a lot of people, even when you get off immunosuppression, will continue to have mild symptoms that come and go, may need to get on some, um, you know, topical therapy or a little bit of therapy here and there. And so probably the GVHD is not completely gone, but it's at low enough activity that it's not really bothering the person. Um, if someone's had GVHD and they really have had no symptoms for 8 to 10 years, and particularly if they've been able to get off immunosuppression, then yes, it could still come back, because it could always come back, but I think the chances are probably pretty low at that point. So I think, unfortunately, once you've had a transplant, anything that happens could be graft-versus-host disease, but it gets less and less likely as time goes on. Thank you. Our next question, Dr. Pavletic. Does GVHD increase your risk for getting other cancers? So we do know that having graft versus host disease, particularly having both acute and chronic graft versus host disease, has been associated with higher risk of uh, uh, getting uh, a cancer uh, somewhere down the road after allogeneic transplant usually takes at least five to ten and beyond years uh, uh, follow-up. Well, fortunately, uh, in the big numbers, those instance instances are relatively rare, uh, so the risk is uh, only can be detected when a larger populational studies. Why is this uh, some particular? Uh, types of cancer, like uh, skin cancers or oral, oral cavity cancers, have been found to be more elevated in uh, long-term survivors after allogeneic transplantation, um, uh, and particularly uh, uh, if uh, treatments were uh, uh, delivered with some older drugs, like azathioprine, but uh, even uh, some uh, more recent drugs, like cyclosporine or Serolimus or prednisone have been associated with this high risk of skin or oral cavity cancers. So the good news is uh, that uh, many other uh, most common cancers that occur in general population have no increased association with the uh, chronic uh, graft versus host disease. And uh, in general, uh, recommendation is, is the, the bottom line is to adhere to usual uh, healthcare uh, maintenance preventative practices with your pr uh, primary physicians, uh, and uh, in case there's something else, uh, some high-risk uh, indication detected, like you know some special type of skin or some precancerous skin lesions, and so on, then you can uh, more frequent uh, skin checks or some other preventative measures could be pursued. So, long story short, uh, that, that yes, high-risk risk, but in big numbers, there's really nothing. Uh, to be particularly uh, 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 engaged, but just to do everything and uh, lifestyle uh, measures and uh, maintenance like any other person that's uh, in population uh, to follow for uh, standard preventative measures. There is some research going on. There are some cancers that could be potentially prevented, like using that, that HPV vaccines that have been studied even after allergenic transplant. At this time, we don't know if those could prevent certain type of cancers that are associated with HPV virus, but just mentioning, mentioning this as an area of research that uh, may end up someday even uh, our ability to uh, actively uh, prevent certain cancers uh, um, in uh, um, transplant survivors. Thank you, Dr. Pavletic. Dr. Lee, uh, patients that I received a BMT in September 2017, I was diagnosed with GVHD in February 2019, which manifested as myositis, polymyositis, as, as it affected many muscle groups. How rare is GVHD in the muscles? Um, yeah, thanks, Sue. So GVHD of the muscles is definitely recognized, but I would say it's very rare. It's probably less than 1% of people will get it. However, when you get it, it is... Um, it, it needs to be treated right away, and it can have devastating side effects. 
I will say I haven't seen very many cases um, uh, in my career, but the ones that I have seen actually have responded pretty well to our treatments. The problem is that as you taper those treatments off, um, it tends to come back again. And one of the, the treatments that we tend to use is steroids, which can also cause muscle weakness. And so it's very important to be under the care of someone who can follow very closely. Oftentimes that is a neurologist who can taper the prednisone um, and the other immunosuppressants and, and watch out for that balance between treatment side effects versus the actual polymyositis uh, graft-versus-host disease. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, next question, Dr. Kevletic. I have skin GVHD and the pigment in my skin has changed color. It's being treated with triamcinolone and tacrolimus. Will the skin color change be permanent? So uh, ch uh, changes in the uh, skin pigmentation and color, you know, increased pigmentation or decreased uh, pigmentation is a disturbing uh, uh, manifestation that can go with the chronic graft versus host disease of, the, of skin. Uh, it's something that's definitely uh, a very, very prevalent uh, concern among patients. Uh, uh, from our end, uh, 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 I, uh, I mean, from, as a physician, we, we're usually more alarmed when we see those uh, more uh, dramatic uh, manifestations uh, that are associated with substantial disability and, and you know, can be even life-threatening, you know, with the very active, extensive red skin rashes or, or uh, contractures or sclerotic lesions, you know, they go with typical active chronic graft versus host disease. So uh, for skin discoloration, well, this can be part of the chronic graft versus host of the skin. In general, we still think that if it's only skin discoloration, the good news is that there is not necessarily too much active disease. So this is the good news and bad news. The good news is that, uh, uh, well, it's not active disease, so it's, uh, it's unlikely to cause some uh, major uh, disabling uh, symptoms uh, 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 and life-threatening problems, but it's certainly very disturbing to the patient. And 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 the the uh, this kind of manifestations are, uh, on the other hand, very very difficult recalcitrant to treat. We actually don't have uh, uh, very effective uh, ways, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I would st strongly recommend you know to. Uh, connect with a very good uh, a dermatologist as well, you know, uh, uh, in this, uh, but there are really no very effective treatments. So this corticosteroid creams or tacrolimus or similar are commonly used, could be some other cosmetic measures. Uh, the good news is that over time, in general, those changes tend to uh, become less intense, less contrasting, less disturbing, or, but takes many years. Uh, but it may never completely go away. But uh, uh, after years of uh, fading of the GVHD process and after transplant, so the encouraging part would be that this can somewhat get improved. But it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a annoying, a disturbing, and and uh, and and a problem that doesn't. So again, doesn't go with active disease, but it's very difficult uh, at this time to 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 treat effectively, unfortunately. Thank you, Dr. Pedalatic. Next question, Dr. Lee. My daughter has severe scleroderma, fibrotic tissue. She's on Imbruvica for a year and also on Jacophy for seven months. She has very limited mobility. Do these medicines take a long time to have a positive effect to loosen her skin? Well, I'm sorry to hear about this, just like the other uh, two people who had their questions. Again, sclerosis is really, really very difficult for us to treat. Um, to address the specific question, you know, um, chronic GVHD takes a long time usually to respond to our treatments, and particularly in sclerosis, I usually give any treatment that I'm trying at least three or six months to see if, if you're getting any benefit. Um, sometimes in sclerosis, just not getting worse is actually a benefit if someone has been progressing up until they tried a new treatment. Um, for these two uh, treatments that are mentioned, so the Abrivica and the Jacophy, you know, we really think that if they're working, they're working by preventing future damage and ongoing damage. It, they're probably not directly affecting the sclerosis 
and the sclerotic tissue that's already there. That's probably just keeping additional damage from happening. And then hopefully the person's own body um, will, as we turn over all of our tissues, help to loosen and to soften and, and to address the sclerosis. So I do think you have to give any treatment a while. Um, in this particular case, if someone's been on it for a year and for seven months and, and their person's actually getting worse, in my mind, it would be time to move on and to try something else. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Our next question, Dr. Jane, does ocular GVHD ever go away or is this a lifelong issue? Thank you for the question. Um, ocular GVHD, it, um, it's the highest risk of developing it is uh, around seven months after the bone marrow transplant, uh, uh, up to two years. And the reason why ocular GVHD de develops is because of uh, the immunological attack that's going on on the surface of the eye due to the uh, graft versus host disease uh, processes that are taking place uh, systemically. So the fuel that, dri that is driving this inflammation is the GVHD processes. And that's why uh, the structures of the eye, uh, they become uh, damaged. The uh, lacrimal gland, which produces tears, uh, ceases to produce tears because it's destroyed, replaced by fibrosis. The surface of the eye uh, is, uh, is damaged, and so on. Uh, so early on, it is uh, the ocular, the GVHD processes that are, uh, that are causing the trouble, that are fueling the fire. Uh, about two years or uh, so, maybe about three, four years as time passes, uh, these immunological processes, uh, they tend to burn out. Uh, but in the wake of what has happened, the patient's eye has become now dry, it is not producing tears, and it has lost the ability to, let's say, produce even oil on the surface. So it has become a inflamed, tear deficient, dry eye, and at that point, uh, maybe it is not it is not the ocular it, it is not the GVHD processes that are driving any inflammation, but the dry eye processes uh, that are driving the inflammation. So uh, the G, ocular GVHD processes, I would say, uh, would probably go away, but uh, the inflammation due to its sequelae or its consequences uh, will then continue to drive the inflammation forward. And for that reason, the treatment, some form of treatment to treat the dry eye would be probably lifelong. Whether that treatment is just artificial tears or whether that treatment is artificial tears with some steroids or serum tears will depend upon what is the extent of damage ocular GVHD, GVHD has caused um, in its wake. So, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did you have something else you wanted to add? Oh, that'll be fine. That's okay. All right, next question, please. What is the current standard of care for discontinuing immunosuppressants after an unrelated mismatch allogeneic stem cell transplant? Dr. Pavletta, can you answer that? Yeah, so, so um, thank you for this question. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I would say that uh, after unrelated mismatch allogeneic stem cell transplants, the gener in general, the, the uh, tapering of immunosuppression uh, uh, approach, uh, it's no different than uh, uh, after, like after any other conventional uh, uh, allogeneic uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Uh, there are some protocols that uh, tend to delay tapering or there are some studies, but in general, uh, 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 the principle is the same, you know, we try, uh, and it's driven by uh, so the, the, on the, the, the fact is that uh, uh, unrelated mismatch allogeneic transplants are associated with more um, acute and chronic uh, uh, graft versus host disease. So the rate of uh, tapering immunosuppression is really driven uh, as usual by, by uh, manifestations of uh, graft versus host disease that uh, in this particular setting actually are more common. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's more likely that patients would stay longer on uh, uh, immunosuppressive regimen or, or treatments for graft versus host itself because of it's more common. So in general, nowadays, when uh, most patients have a 
where almost all patients have a, a better choices of type of allogeneic donors. Uh, the focus is move, moving more into choosing uh, uh, transplants that would result with lower likelihood of uh, uh, of uh, complications there associated with the mismatches uh, uh, and uh, so, so that's uh, 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 we're, we're trying uh, uh, in the future with the evol evolution of the field we're going to try to avoid uh, uh, this kind of uh, but you know, reality is uh, some patients uh, need our transplant that's maybe the only option and and uh, so this is the case uh, tapering is uh, driven by clinical activity of graft versus host disease, how much is present. Thank you, Dr. Pavlenik. Uh, next question, Dr. Lee. How common is central nervous system GVHD? Can you recover from CNS GVHD? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a great question. I think a lot of people would want to know the answer to this. Um, you know, for a long time we said that the central nervous system was one of the sanctuary um, organs and that we didn't think that it was involved with GVHD. I think more recently there's been um, an understanding that, yes, um, people who have chronic GVHD do seem to have um, symptoms in their central nervous system, so in their brain, um, ranging all the way from, you know, thought disturbance all the way to actual strokes. Um, but because we haven't really been collecting the data, um, we don't really know how, um, how common this would be, and we also don't know in general what the natural history of it is. I will say that I know a lot of people are actively um, studying this process, actually both in humans and in mice, and so I hope we do know more about this in the future. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Next question, Dr. Pepletic. Going into my BMT, very little was discussed about GVHD. It was offered up as a potential side effect that could be dealt with as if it weren't a big deal. From what I've read, 40 to 50 percent of BMT recipients get GVHD. Is there any shift in protocol to talk more honestly about GVHD? Uh, can you go back to the question, please? And to provide more support after BMT, such as offering up more GVHD experts at treatment centers? So this is a... Uh, uh very important question that goes to all of us, uh, really, as a as a transplant community and, and physicians and uh, um, um, advocacy and, and 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 patient support groups, uh, how we can uh, better address this uh, not uh, 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 that uncommon comment and concern that we hear from patients after usually longer term, uh, later after allogeneic transplants when graft versus host disease, particularly chronic, uh, becomes a prominent problem. And uh, short answer be, would be we all need to uh, keep in mind this uh, aspect and all try to do best possible job. Not that we are not doing, but uh, uh, there's always uh, 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 room for improvement and for joint action in this arena. Uh, I would say education is a key word. Um, and uh, the good news is uh, that, well, thinking forward, is that uh, uh, moving into allogeneic transplant, it, it's something there's a lot of acuity in how to treat cancer and focuses on leukemia and, and, and how to overcome lymphoma. Uh, but there's usually, it's a process. And, uh, and there is, uh, 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 from day one, when uh, in, in, in general oncology clinic to transplant clinic and, and all this uh, uh, counseling and planning of the transplant, there is still a substantial amount of uh, time and golden opportunity that we all should be trying to be better off in using in terms of uh, 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 counseling, in terms of uh, using amazing uh, uh, materials. You know, uh, we always try to... Uh, emphasize how great material is available on the uh, as a resources of the patient advocacy groups such as BMT Infonet and others. Uh, it's a uh, uh, it's it's a team effort. Caregivers, uh, 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 care providers try to pro provide maximum information and and education and try to get uh, uh, this. Uh. Now the, the the reality is that. Uh, everything is focused uh, 
and on how to treat cancer. It's really the, the main, because 90% of our transplants are done because of cancer. And uh, I have to say that sometimes uh, we're having this uh, number one objective while we're doing our genetic transplants. Uh, it, it does a little bit fall behind in terms of uh, uh, focus, uh, acuity, even even it's uh, not something that everybody wants necessarily to hear much about what's going to happen three years down the road and is this uh, disabling chronic GVHD going to be uh, active three, four years down the road when there's no leukemia anymore uh, in sight. So uh, a very complicated, uh, important issue that we all need to constantly keep trying to do, to, do, uh, uh, to keep in mind and and uh, uh, education would be again a, a word that I would like to uh, underline uh, as we move forward uh, with, with uh, what 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 we are doing uh, in in transplant field. Thank you, Dr. Pavlik. Um I think the next question will be the last question we'll take from the pre-submitted questions, so that we have time for the questions that people are chatting in now. If you are on the line and you have a question that you want to chat in, please use the chat box on the lower left and we will try to get to them, as many of them as we can. So Dr. Jane, what are the options for opening up tear ducts? I can feel my tears, but they just do not come out. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, as I understand this question, I'm uh, going to answer. Um, the what ocular GVHD does by the immunolog immunological attack and inflammation is to destroy the lacrimal gland, the main lac lacrimal gland which uh, resides under the bone, uh, uh, just above the lateral angle of the eye. And this gland produces tears uh, as we cry, or uh, there is reflex tearing. Um, it's because of this gland. And this is destroyed, so this is not uh, able to produce those uh, tears. There are some other uh, accessory lacrimal glands that are present in, uh, also uh, under the in the uh, in the tissues that cover our lids, uh, and those may produce some tears. So maybe there is uh, some feeling that there is there are some tears because of those accessory glands, but because the main lacrimal gland that it, that produces those reflex, those profuse tears, that's da damage, that doesn't function anymore because it's destroyed by inflammation. Uh, the tears, one would feel, just don't come out, although you can uh, still feel some wetness because of um, uh, some tears that are still hanging around over the surface of the eye. Now, uh, discuss options for opening tear ducts now. Uh, for the main lacrimal gland, there is no way we can open tear ducts because not, there is no purpose uh, if the gland is not producing any tears. If the question refers to opening the uh, nasolacrimal duct, which is the passage that leads from the inner angle of the eye to the nose from where the tears drain, and uh, oftentimes these are plugged uh, with punctal plugs and are uh, permanently closed by cauterization, yes, of course, uh, there are surgical procedures to open these uh, uh, ducts, the nasolacrimal ducts, but there is no uh, option that I'm aware of that is used to, uh, it will also serve no purpose, to open uh, the ducts of the lacrimal gland, which is uh, producing tears. Thank you, Dr. Jane. <clears throat> now we'll jump to questions that have been submitted this evening, just to make sure we get some of those in as well. Uh, first question is, I understand that taking prednisone and immune suppressant uh, increases the risk that the transplant will fail. Is this true? Uh, whoever would like to take that question, go for it. Okay. Um, I could take it. Um, and um, um, so I would say that uh, Prednisone, the short answer would be, uh, or, or a question like, what, what does it mean uh, transplant fails? And um, uh, prednisone is typically uh, given for graft versus host disease when it needs to be treated, and uh, 
then that that takes a priority and uh, it's uh, given for a good cause. Uh, if uh, uh, there are many pr problems with prednisone, it's not the drug we like uh, uh, and it has many side effects. It's uh, our best uh, friend and our worst enemy uh, in treating uh, uh, patients uh, with graft versus host disease. Uh, but initially, it works very well in majority of patients. The so so it's given for a reason. In terms of uh, engraftment concerns, if that's a question uh, whether trasma would fail, uh, so in general, I mean, short answer is uh, uh, in patients when they have uh, graft versus host disease are usually well engrafted, and losing a graft is a list of our concerns. So, uh, so to, again, answer is no here. And then the other question is, uh, is it going to hurt graft versus leukemia effects? So should I get or give prednisone? Get prednisone, uh, it's going to hurt my chances of uh, curing uh, an underlying malignancy. And again, answer is uh, whatever evidence we have, uh, uh, the answer is no. The, uh, um, uh, the reasons that uh, uh, create need for giving prednisone are sometimes very serious reasons and can be life-threatening. And, uh, and those reasons uh, can cause a uh, 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 transfer to fail. Uh, but once uh, necessity exists to give prednisone for the treatment, there is absolutely no evidence uh, that uh, likelihood of leukemia uh, uh, comes, uh, coming back is higher. And actually, whatever information we have, actually, that's not the case. So um, I would say it's a complicated answer, but a short answer is, uh, that no, it, uh, we, we, when, when we don't give, we don't like to give prednisone. We, when decision is made to give prednisone, then it's a, for a good reason, and uh, uh, transplant don't fail because of prednisone itself. Thank you, Dr. Pavletic. Dr. Lee, can you speak to the pros and cons of using low dose IL-2 for GVHD treatment and doing UVB1 while taking IL-2? Um, sure. So low-dose IL-2 has been reported to be helpful in people who have chronic GVHD. Um, this is primarily work that was done by the Boston group, um, and it looks like uh, this form of low-dose IL-2, which does have to be given by injection frequently, um, tends to increase regulatory T cells. So we think it has a kind of dampening effect on the immune system. Um, so I think it's a very reasonable thing for someone to try. Um, in terms of combining it with other things, I, I know that there's some clinical trials that combine it with ECP. Um, in terms of, you know, I'm sure you could do it with any other agent. Um, UVB can't speak to that particularly. Other than that, it looks like the IL-2 is, is, you know, pretty safe and reasonably well tolerated, and so it could be combined with other potential GVHD uh, treatments. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pavletic. Does ECP extracorporeal photophoresis need to be done on consecutive days? So ECP is a very uh, uh, often uh, one of, of our probably most often used treatments for chronic GVHD uh, beyond steroids. Uh, now, of course, there are many other uh, options. Um, it can be treated as well or used for acute GVHD in certain uh, circumstances. Um, there is no uh, predetermined schedule of ECP, whether um, once a week, twice a week, three times a week, uh, weekly, every two weeks, there are different schedules. Usually, it's a more intensive beginning and then tapers off over time, uh, but uh, there is no evidence that one schedule is superior more than the other. One of the most popular schedules is using two weeks, two, uh, uh, two days in a row, as, as, as you know, inferred in question. So, so two days in a row every two weeks um, for several consecutive months and maybe then going monthly. So that's a very common, I would say, most uh, 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 schedule that, that probably has uh, uh, the most experience with, but there is no evidence that one schedule the other is superior. Okay, thank you very much. I think that can I just add, I think that that schedule came up when we were using the oral sorolin, and so people didn't want to have 
you know, they wanted to um, condense the time that they were sensitive to the sun and things. Um, here and at many other places, we don't adhere to the two consecutive day requirement. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And while you're on the line here, um, can you speak to this question? Are there any biomarkers to follow for chronic GVHD? And perhaps in your answer, you could explain what a biomarker is. Sure, yeah, I think that's a great question and that's the focus of a lot of my research. So a biomarker is basically a biologic measurement um, that indicates, um, you know, the health and, and the status of the GVHD in a person. And so we've done a lot of work with trying to look at various um, biomarkers. We tend to do blood biomarkers, so things that you can measure, proteins and cells and cell types that you can measure in the blood, but really a biomarker can be any other kind of measurement. I think the short answer is that um, part of, you know, the sort of more high-tech biomarkers that we think might be associated with chronic GVHD to this point have not reached um, anywhere near where we can actually use them clinically and follow them. Um, you know, some people use kind of um, less high-tech biomarkers, so some people follow, for example, eosinophil levels and you know, platelet counts and other kinds of things um, that um, that can indicate whether someone's responding or not. Um, but at this point, most of the biomarkers are still within the research realm. You know, it is hopeful that at some point we'll be able to just draw someone's blood and be able to tell how serious their GVHD is and what kind of treatment we should put them on and whether they're responding. But at this point, um, we don't have enough uh, evidence to do that with any of these. All right, thank you, Dr. Pavletic. Maybe you can answer this one. When your immune system revs up to fight an infection, can it rev up the GVHD at the same time? Well, uh, we don't have hard evidence that that's the case, but uh, we know that uh, anecdotal in practice, uh, we do uh, not uncommonly see associations some of some triggers that uh, are followed by uh, chronic GVHD uh, uh, flare-ups. You know, even after one year or something, not having any, G then it comes. And uh, there's a sense that uh, any trigger to the uh, uh, inflammation um, uh, and immune system potentially could be associated. So anecdotally, yes, after systemic uh, viral infections, you know, so flares can be obtained. Sometimes uh, even like, uh, after topical uh, in interventions like a surgery or local radiation or some injury in certain areas, it can flare up locally or systemically. So it's not common, but, uh, or, you know, the, the common external factor is like uh, exposure to sun, right? We tell everybody don't, you know, get sun exposure because uh, then uh, the case is you get a whole uh, large portion of the skin being uh, exposed to, to, to uh, sun radiation and, and inflammation, so uh, uh, that can uh, trigger. So uh, the, the short answer is uh, it could happen, but uh, most commonly doesn't. All righty, Dr. Lee, can you address this question? What types of GVHD does rituxan treat? Hmm. Well, the the um, the most common thing I think that people try to use rituxan for is actually the sclerotic form of graft-versus-host disease. Um, that was reported by the Italian group as being very effective. Um, we actually did a randomized trial here where we looked at rituxan um, and imatinib, another thing that has been um, uh, reported to be effective by the Italian group, and um, had some responses but um, didn't see nearly the response that they had, rec that they had seen. Um, we tend to use rituxan when we think that um, it's something, a, a type of chronic GVHD that is more associated with B cells, since that's what rituxan treats. And so we tend to use it, um, again, in scleroderma um, or in sometimes the arthralgias um, or some other manifestations that we think are related to um, uh, B cells. Um, I think it's a very reasonable thing to try. It is important to realize that if you're going to give someone rituxan, it's very important to check hepatitis B before you do that because people can reactivate if they otherwise hepatitis, have hepatitis B under control. And it's important to remember that rituxan has long-lasting effects in suppressing the B cells, and so immunoglobulin levels can be low. And if people have frequent infections, that would have to be uh, repleted afterwards. Thank you. I'll throw this one out to both you 
Dr. Lee and Dr. Pavletic. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Maybe you will. What are the GI and GBHD risks if I have a level one upper and level two lower and my gallbladder has failed and needs surgical removal? Well, um, I assume you're referring to uh, GVHD uh, grade one and two, um, and um, any connection with the gallbladder, I'm not uh, directly aware of uh, uh, these two um, problems being uh, uh, connected, but certainly some uh, symptoms of the gallbladder or bile duct related disease uh, could uh, mimic certain manifestations of uh, uh, GVHD, particularly upper GI tract. Uh, so, that, that, you know, that uh, in terms of uh, staging, uh, grade one, upper, uh, grade two, lower, so that would mean in general that it's a grade two, probably at minimum uh, of overall acute. If I talk, we're talking about acute GVHD, and uh, uh, that uh, typically needs to be treated with some systemic immunosuppression. And if I exactly answer the question, feel, please feel free to expand if you don't think that's answering exactly what you needed. All right, thank you, Dr. Pavletic. And Dr. Lee, mm -hmm. how can you treat GVHD of the lips? I have sensitivity to sunlight and red sauces. That's a tough one because the lips are pretty sensitive. Um, you know, I think if it's an acute um, symptom, then we do sometimes use steroids. You have to use that very sparingly unless you, or you'll get atrophy on the lips. I think the most important thing actually is, is protection, so making sure that you have a good Vaseline coat, that you avoid the things um, like this person has noticed, so for sun and for, you know, different foods that can cause sensitivity. Um, but the lips are tough. Sometimes we also try to use topical tacrolimus, um, and, and for some people they respond to that, but, um, but usually, uh, you know, if it's, if it's a very sensitive area, um, a little bit of steroids very briefly um, is the best treatment. All right, and then Dr. Pavletic, perhaps for you, uh, what success have you seen using the drug Jacopy? My daughter was recently diagnosed with chronic GVHD following her transplant in February of 2019. She had two bouts of skin, very serious, but no scleroderma, and one bout of gut. She recently started on Jacopy. So Jacopy is um, one of the newer drugs uh, that we use more commonly with uh, chronic graft versus host disease and uh, response rates to Jacopy have been um, varying in different uh, trials, but I would say uh, it seems that response rate is somewhere around 50, even up to 70 or so percent. Um, so it's a very popular uh, class of drugs uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, uh, it's uh, uh, there's a need for better drugs for chronic graft versus host disease, and whenever something new mechanistically comes, uh, then uh, there's a uh, 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 lots of excitement uh, about this. Uh, the the other uh, aspect is uh, that uh, this kind of drugs are uh, it's they're easy to take. It's it's a tablet, uh, and uh, in general they're quite well tolerated. They're not without side effects. They can react with certain uh, types of viral infections or cytomegalovirus, so they can cause anemia, but in general, they're well tolerated. Uh, and uh, uh, as far as we know, there is no particular system uh, 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 or type of manifestation of uh, chronic GVHD that responds better or worse uh, to this particular agent. Uh, and it's definitely uh, something that uh, um, has to be considered uh, in, in in patients uh, needing uh, uh, next lines of therapies. Uh, it has to be said that uh, particular so Jacopy is now approved for treatment of, of acute graft versus host disease. Uh, uh, it was approved last uh, May, so it's a very good news uh, because uh, we have now first uh, in recent history uh, uh, drug approval for acute GVHD, uh, and it seems to be. Uh, particularly promising uh, in, in GI uh, manifestations. 
uh, in that setting, um, um, it has to be said that studies in chronic GVHD actually controlled prospective trials are still in progress. So while there is a widespread enthusiasm, and uh, for a good reason it seems to use Jacophy, we still don't have uh, uh, studies being published or even completed that are conclusively saying this is better than alternatives. So research is still going on, but the, 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 the high promise of those agents, uh, uh, it's going ahead of the curve of research, and, and it's been wildly uh, spread into practice. There are other JAK inhibitors in research that, are, that may be coming, so it's a very active area of uh, uh, research, and there may be new agents to come uh, beyond jak but again, it's still uh, uh, something that studies are going on in terms of more conclusive assessment uh, uh, of, of the benefit. Thank you, Dr. Pavlenik. <laughs> Dr. Lee, is there any research going on about the impact on GVHD of probiotics and the microbiome? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think that um, that a lot, most of the active research in GVHD and the microbiome is in the acute setting where we have more data. Um, it does look like at least there is an association between certain types of organisms that could be affected by antibiotics and the onset and the severity of acute graft-versus-host disease. We know much less when it comes to chronic. Um, I've seen a few abstracts that have looked at this that suggest a similar phenomenon is going on. Um, the specific age, specific micro, uh, microbes seem like they're a little bit different, um, but it's very, very early on in that field. Um, this is something that we're studying as well, and I think we'll have more information in the next few years. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Pavlenik, does having chronic GVHD increase your body's daily caloric need to maintain your weight? Can you repeat the question, please? <clears throat> does having chronic GVHD increase your body's daily caloric needs to maintain your weight? Do you need more calories? if you have GVHD in order to maintain your weight? Well, that's a, <laughs> I, I hate to say, but it, it is an interesting question. So we do know that the general, uh, it's complicated answer uh, as far as I know, and uh, I, I don't think it's been studied uh, uh, intensively, uh, but uh, they're clearly nutritional or nutrition-related problems uh, that are associated with uh, chronic graft versus host disease. And um, the, the common sense says, uh, tells us that, yes, there is an in increased uh, catabolism and nutritional needs in this kind of situations, right, to, to help body overcome these challenges and, and uh, uh, regenerate, you know. Uh, so uh, everything that works for uh, um, other people, uh, it works particularly for patients in this situation in terms of nutrition and, you know, um, uh, health care maintenance and so on, uh, 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 lifestyle. Uh, now, there are two, two spectrums of uh, nutritional manifestations. On one end is a small percentage of uh, uh, patients that have very, very low, they have very low weight, low uh, 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 body mass index. Uh, um, that uh, are particularly endangered, and uh, it seems that uh, 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 I have to say I don't think it's fully understood the, the mechanism, but it seems that catabolic processes are uh, at a high rate. The, the, the body mass index could be very low. Even it can uh, survival could be impaired at some of this. Uh, 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 so it's uh, more commonly in patients that have associated uh, GI tract manifestations or pulmonary manifestations, uh, but uh, it's, pro, uh, it, it's most likely due to pro, uh, a question that you're asking. There's some little evidence that certain drugs can sometimes cause these situations. Rarely, there have been case reports associated with, with CELSEPT, the drug, that, uh, particularly in children, causing some uh, kind of a cachexia. That, uh, so just keep in mind, it's very, very rare, but it's been described and very complicated. There's an other end of spectrum that's not necessarily good either, but it's overweight. So we call this metabolic syndrome that goes more with the overweight situation, with the increased inflammation in the body, with uh, uh, problems in lipid and, and, and uh, 
uh, uh, glucose metabolism, a cardiovascular risk factor get a go with this, and then certain exposed patients to risk associated with this kind of uh, metabolic syndrome problems. And that's on the other end. And I would say um, um, that goes with the decreased muscle mass and so on, commonly with often with steroids administration. So uh, I would say there are two spectrums uh, uh, of extremes, uh, 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 maybe 10 or so percent on, on, on low weight and maybe 20-ish uh, uh, percent or so to, uh, on, on the higher end that are associated with chronic GVHD. And uh, we need to do much more uh, efforts in better understanding the processes and even more so what's the best intervention. Thank you, Dr. Pavlenik, and I think we have time for one more question before we close, and perhaps Dr. Liu can close this out. Is there a role for cannabidiol, CBD, in the treatment of GVHD? I understood there was a study out of Israel and ongoing studies at clinicaltrials.gov. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question because many, many people are interested in the medicinal side of, um, components of this. Um, there is a study in Israel, the one that I'm aware of is actually for acute graft versus host disease uh, prevention, so it's not for chronic. Um, I've seen some preliminary, uh, you know, single patient kinds of um, um, cases um, where people have taken it, and it looks like it's been beneficial, but those are just anecdotes. Um, I think other uh, people are trying to study this, and I think it is quite worthwhile studying it, um, but at this point, the data are, are very preliminary. All right, thank you. And with that, I think we'll need to end the webinar tonight. Thank you, Dr. Pavletic, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Jane for sharing your expertise with us and answering some of our questions. I know we didn't get to everyone's question. Um, if you want to have your question answered and we didn't get to it tonight, uh, email us at help, H-E-L-P, at bmtinfonet.org, and we'll see if we can get an answer for you. I do want to point out we have a couple of resources uh, that you might be interested in. We do have a book called Graft vs. Host Disease, What to Know, What to Do, and it's a free publication which can help guide you through GVHD. Um, all you need to do is order it online or phone us at 888-597-7674, and we'll be happy to uh, send you a copy. It's also available in Spanish. And then for those who are interested, we will have our next Survivorship Symposium, which has five or six, I forget how many, uh, workshops about various aspects of GVHD uh, during the two-day weekend, May 2nd and 3rd in Boston. So if you are interested in potentially attending, you can call us, 888-597-7674, or you can visit us online at bmtinfonet.org. Uh, the first picture you'll see is uh, click here for the symposium and you'll get all the details. Thank you, everyone, and again, thanks to Pharmacyclics and the company and Janssen Biotech and Jazz Pharmaceuticals for supporting this event. Have a good evening.